Um, yes, Jim. Um, let's start off. Yeah, I've had uh, two my double cheekbone reconstructions, both sides, and then I've had uh, three shoulder surgeries. Um, I think I've had nine or ten on my right knee. Um, and the other frustrating thing is, Jim, is I can't do anything. I can't run. I mean, I can't run. I can't do weights. Um, it's it affects your life after. How are you? I'm very good, thank you, Jim. How are you doing? Good, mate. We finally got you. It's been two years. Yeah. We've been talking about it, haven't it's we? It's been a while. I'm sorry, mate. I'm sorry. I've been uh, I've been dodging you with uh, with poor poor reception. That's what it is. How is it actually being away from uh, you know all the drama? I suppose in the Kalahari Desert. No, it's been it's been good, Jim. Um, this lockdown period, this uh, whole crisis, hasn't really affected us much where we live. I mean, we've been in self isolation for three years now, so nothing's really changed there. Um, it's been yeah, it's been pretty strange. They're all adapting to 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 normal life after rugby, as you realise, and uh, doing something completely different than what I'm used to, and then being out in the farm. Um, it's taken a time to get used to it, but I mean, it's uh, it's amazing. I'm uh, really enjoying my time out there. Um, we've had a really tough drought the last three years, so it was um, it was challenging. But um, yeah, it's going well, man. Family's happy, uh, wide open spaces, sunny days, so uh, it's not too much to complain about. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that transition, John, because we had many a conversations about it uh, at Saracens. I think the longer that time goes on, and you know, I've been watching documentaries. Like I watched the Michael Jordan documentary. It kind of gets the fire burning a little bit. But a player like yourself, who literally was body on the line, the physicality, and you had so many highs in your career, in your club career, of course. How's the transition been? For yeah. you? Because you, you went from being in St Albans, London. You know, we were loving it. Like loads of interaction, loads yeah. of people. I've had a little bit in terms of isolation being out in the countryside where we are, and I miss that, but you have gone from two opposite ends yeah. of the spectrum. How's that been? Yeah, it's been really tough, Jim. I'm not going to lie. Um, it's It's been really tough. Uh, that first year, like you said, that first, I would say, half a year, um, we come back and you're back home. You haven't been here for a while, and everything is great. You know, you, you, you're you done. You know it's time. Your body can recover now. You don't have to go through the pain every, um, th- through the pain every day again. Um uh, that last year of playing for me was was agony, and I struggled. That's I just I just couldn't play anymore. But I just wanted to get one more year in, and ended it um, probably a year later than I should have. So it was good to have the rest, but it was it was quick, and then I started missing it again. Um, it's um, being so isolated as as I am, you kind of feel lost. You feel lost. You know, it's um, what are you now? You're an ex rugby player. Um, you, nobody really giving you any rewards for anything you do. It's just you and yourself out there. Well, me and my family, but um, it's it's completely different worlds to what I do now. And nobody sees what I do now. I work on my own mostly. Um, I do a lot of jobs that you wouldn't get a lot of credit for. So um, it's it's been tough. It's been tough, and a lot of days I do miss it. Um, the social, but obviously. Um, we do social. Obviously, we get a lot of people around, and we have barbecues, and um, it's it's an amazing lifestyle that I do live now. I have a lot of time to to just like I said, get friends over, and we'll have a barbecue. And but it's it's nothing like I had over there. Um, the, the time there was so special. I think what makes it so hard is because Saracens was such a good club. You know, they look after us so well, and I made so many great friends. You guys, all of you. I mean, I always wonder what you guys are doing, and and um, you you watch rugby games, you watch Saris games, and you see the boys play, and you, it feels like ages ago. And then when you do watch it, you you start missing it. Especially that first year when I stopped playing, I didn't want to watch rugby. I was well, angry for some reason reason that I that I'm not out there playing myself, and um, almost felt like rugby's um, left me or stranded me somewhere. But it's um, it as as time goes on, and then you realise, listen. This was a great period of my life. It was, it was, um, it was my dream job. You know, it was something that I always wanted to do. I always wanted to play rugby from a young boy, and um, 
it became a reality. So you were one of very few players where you'd walk in to the changing room after the game and you'd be like, this guy literally looks like he's been in a war. And being out there with you, <laughs> and we speak about yeah. the skill set and a lot of tries get rewarded and you know guys who make line breaks and stuff like that. But I think, well, you only have to look now and you're not a player where you look back and you get better and better as time retires. When you played, mm. and even so now, you were in everyone's like top 15 in terms of hardest players they've played against and that they've played with. But that's one of the things I Thank wanted to know. talk about because there's a, there, there was a little part of me after that year um, of retiring where my body was in such a way, mentally I was in such a bad way that I didn't mm. necessarily resent rugby, but... I kind of questioned whether I went about it the right way. Could have I done two more years if I looked after myself yeah. a little bit more? If you know I didn't have to take the painkillers that I took, if I didn't have to play through the pain, through the broken ribs, could have I extended my career? So when you look back at it, and we can talk about that aligned with when the game was finished at Saracens, we walk and change, we won many games, and you were sat there with blood and your nose across your face, and you'd, you'd gone in and had 10, 15 stitches, which was a regular occurrence. Is that the bit that you miss? Yeah. No, no, I, I do miss that. I do miss that part of the game. That's that's how I play. And I think I think that was a probably the best feeling when you've put in a massive shift and you've broken yourself and you you walk off the pitch and you sit in the locker room and you sit around each other, all the boys, and it's been a good day. Um, and you don't have to say anything really about the game. You know, everybody knows that you've done what you needed to do, you know, and uh, you look around and you'll see these um, 22 other guys have done exactly the same. Um, and that's, I mean, that's that's special when you sit there in that locker room and you get that feeling of everybody just worked their guts off now and it's and it's done. Um, we can we can relax a little bit now. So um, the, the only the frustrating thing for me was the last year is that I couldn't train as much as I wanted to train, and everybody was just moving forward and getting better and getting better. And for me, I started I started realizing I was getting I was getting weaker and weaker, and I couldn't do as much and. And that was frustrating. I didn't. I, I, if I wanted to play, I wanted to play. You know, I wanted to give it everything. I wanted to get stuck in and and move like I want to do. So, um, I mean, it's it's um, it's not something really that I could have done differently. I, I don't know. It's. I think as a younger, when, you, when you're younger, you probably have to look after yourself a little bit. I, when I was 28 and I joined Saracens, I felt like I felt like a beast. Like I wasn't. I was never on a physio bed. Nothing. Played full games. Um, I played a year in France, um, two years before that, where I played 30, I think 36 games in a row, 18 minutes every weekend. And I mean, nothing, my body was never, I never went to a failure, no injuries. And then when that first one hit me at 28, it was just constantly. Just with a player like yourself, who a lot of people see as one of the hardest players who have ever played the game, I think Rugby Pass named you in one. I don't know whether that was a poll, but I think the consensus would be that you're in that. I don't know whether it's a thing for you or not. Um, I quite like it, actually. Uh, but just yeah. give us a, a kind of uh, outline of all the injuries that you had. I know we spoke about it before, but I think for someone like you, and they watch the way that you play, and you mentioned the injuries were tough at the end. So hundreds of scars, but just go from head to toe in terms of some of the injuries that you had. Um, yes, Jim. Um, let's start off. Yeah, I've had uh, two my double cheekbone reconstructions, both sides, and then I've had... Uh, Three shoulder surgeries. Um, I think I've had nine or ten on my right knee. Um, the big one was I had a high tibial osteotomy, which is um, I came back from a from a PCL tear and I um, just came back training and I was just in so much pain I just I couldn't do anything. And they said, "No, go through it. You'll get through it." And I kept saying to them, "Listen, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't get better. I can't. The pain's not going away." So they had to they take out a wedge in your leg, so they cut out that wedge. Um, and they kind of restructure your leg so it's in a different angle to, to take the pressure of a certain on the inside of your of, of your joint. And uh, remember that one specifically because I woke up the morning. It was done in Cape Town um, in Stellenbosch, and, and then I woke up the morning and, and um, a physio came over and she said, "Oh, sorry, I, I, that's probably the end of your career, isn't it? You you won't come back from that." And I was pissed off straight away. I was like, "This is my life." I mean, <laughs> how can you tell me? I won't be playing rugby again, and that was a that was a long battle. That was two years, two years plus. After two years, I came back and I had to do I get another surgery and another one. Um, um, yeah, that's that's it. And there's a lot of small ones, broken ribs, um, fingers, um, but I think my knee and my shoulders probably probably the big ones, the ones that um, that I feel now, the ones that I 
probably would need replacing soon. I mean, my, my shoulder and my knee, with it, there's nothing really more you can do you can do about it. So, I mean, the, the next thing would be replacement. So, I'm hoping within the next 10 years they get some pretty decent um, replacements. Um, and the, the other frustrating thing is, Jim, is I can't do anything. I can't run. I mean, I can't run. I can't do weights. Um, it's It affects your life after, you know, though your whole... I have to do if I want to do exercise. I have to get on a bike, you know. And it's it's good. It's good to do it, and you you get the demons out. You get yourself in that dark dark space in which you can push yourself. But it's just not the same as you're doing loads of other stuff. Going for a run when you want to go for a run, or um, doing some weights or whatever the case may be, just for your head. Mm. And what do you think about the state of the game at the minute? Um, let's talk about Saracens because that maybe lead us on to the money and stuff in the game, you, you touched on it there and I've been very vocal and you said there's a lot of haters out there, which I understand, you know, I, I've been heavily involved in it because I do a podcast and it's got a, quite a big following and there's a huge interaction on there. I also work on the podcast with Andy Good, who yeah. has been very vocal around it mm. and I understand from his point of view, he feels he's got a job to do, but mine's an emotional attachment, right? And I think you touched mm. on it then. I think unless you were yeah. in that Saracen's bubble and they were the best three years of, uh, of my life even now and yeah. i was questioning it when it was all happening um mm. was it legit was it based on truth and honesty and all them things that we spoke about mm -hmm. honesty being the, the big one and yeah. i sit here now speaking to you and getting goosebumps thinking about some of the interactions that we had on and off the field and yeah that's enough for me to reignite the fire but also for me to understand that it was real. So as a guy who literally put his body on the line and probably wasn't paid the amount of money that you probably should have done in terms of where the game is at now, yeah. watching it unfold from the farm on the Kalahari Desert in Namibia, how has that affected you and where do you stand with it all now? I know the game's in, in a completely different place now with the, yeah. the situation we find ourselves in, but the Saracens thing's been the biggest talking point in and yeah. arguably in rugby history. How are you with it all? Yeah, it's like the emotional attachment is is big. You know, that's that's the thing. You always want to defend the club, and I always will. You know, um, the unfortunate bit for me is the players, you know, they play rugby. They um, they don't sign contracts. They don't have anything to do with it, with, with how much money who receives. We, didn't, we never talked about who receives what, what your contract is and what my contract is. And... Um, I mean, that's what makes it so frustrating because people look at that specific point that, oh, and oh yes, they've cheated. I mean, I mean, at the end of the day, it's 23 players versus 23 players. If they're fresher than the other team, yeah, maybe that does play a difference. But I mean, I, I remember the amount of work we put in, you know, the amount of time and analysis. And I mean, we've, we've worked our balls off, you know. It was a club where if you didn't work hard enough, you weren't welcome, you know. That's 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 just that was one of our, our values, and that's what Brendan when he started there. Listen, if you're not if you're not willing to work hard enough, if you make mistakes, we all make mistakes. But if you work hard enough, you'll there'll be a place for you in this club. And I mean, everybody without everybody knew that, and everybody could see the amount of work people put in, you know, and the the amount of the small things, the the TSPDAs, the the things that people don't see, you know, those those were the things that made the club special, and. Um, for the club's name to be tainted because of the salary cap thing. I mean, I do understand it. it is, if you break the rules, you break the rules. There are a set of rules for a reason. But, um, I mean, for me, I still see the player. I still feel sorry for the player, you know, who just goes, goes out there every week and busts his balls and gives his absolute best uh, in a great team with great players and great coaches. And, and um, yeah, you get, you get abuse from that. And... Um, it, is, it has hurt the name of Saracens, unfortunately, um, the whole scandal. And um, But I hope we can, and I'm sure people will see in years to come, um, it's more than this, just the cash. You know, there's, uh, there's a lot of values and a lot, a lot of things in place that, that does make this club a great club. So that brings me on to you getting back into the game. You mentioned it earlier on. Uh, in what kind of capacity then? I tried to do a bit of digging on Namibia. I know there's been a few issues um, yeah. and then, you look at it now, it's almost impossible to gauge where any rugby nation is, any rugby team. So first of all, what yeah. are you thinking then? What kind of capacity do you want to get back into the game? You'd be a huge asset, whatever you did. The king of Namibia, is that something that you're <laughs> going to look at as well? I mean, I'm sure they're chomping at the bit to get you in somehow. 
Well, not really. You know, it's been it's been tough. I've been a bit outspoken since I came back, um, just because I'm retired now, and I've got I've got free reigns to kind of say what I want to say and what's wrong and what's not what's what's right. I believe uh, we have so much talent. You know, it's it's in our DNA. We love playing rugby. Yes, we're only 2.5 million people in the country, but we've got we've got rugby in us. You know, that's that's since we go to to uh, grade one as we have rugby. Uh, you play rugby, you know. You look up to rugby players, and you um, everybody loves a game of rugby. And um, not enough is being done to to grow the game. You know, we um, there's a vast country. There's a lot of towns far apart. You know, there's townships. We there's nothing's being done to get those kids, less fortunate kids, kids who are grow up on the streets or kids who haven't been exposed to the game of rugby, who don't own TVs and stuff like that. Nobody goes out there and and puts back in these kids and get them involved in the game. You know. Um, I did a, I did a, you were with me with, uh, I know Bobesi Pride, do you know Bobesi Pride? You were with that Kenyan climb thing, sorry, that, that you enjoyed so much. We still nearly died. <laughs> and I was in the lodges, you guys were killing it through the mountains. Um, so I worked with Bobesi Pride in, in Kenya a while ago, and um, I think two, three years ago. And yeah, that was amazing to see what they do um, and where they work. You know, we were in Kenya, in, in Nairobi, in like the poorest of poor. It's, you'll drive by and a goat's head's been cut off right next to you in the street. And it's, um, it's vultures all over. It's very, very poor. Kids come to school that haven't got, most of them clothes are ripped. And, and um, we... Basically, we put in a training week and, and just got a couple of kids involved, just teaching them to go to rugby. They'd never seen it in their life. And within a week, you know, I saw how many kids, like how they loved it, you know, how they enjoyed the game. And it's and for me, that's what rugby is, you know, the values of it specifically, respect. And you teach them um, to um, to listen, to um, to respect each other, you know, to work hard and to... All those things that you can take into life, you know, and if you can, I mean, especially in the in the poorer areas, that's that's what I would like to do in Namibia as well, and go into areas like that. And and before you open your eyes, you now within 10, 20 years, there'll be some amazing stories. Guys coming out of the poorest of townships and wherever they um, grew up and becoming superstars just because something stuck, you know, somebody mm. put something into them. And uh, I mean, rugby has the power to do that. And um, my, the frustrating thing for me is nothing is being done. Nobody's been in a, with the NRU. Uh, they don't make any good appointments. Um, when Phil, Le da Phil Davis joined us, things changed massively. Phil was really good for us. Um, he had a professional view on things, um, which I also tried to explain to NRU. I said, listen, you need those guys. You need those guys. We haven't got the know-how um, to do it. Um, it's, it's one thing to say you've got a level three coaching um, uh, certificate. But if you haven't been involved in the setup and, 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 and the professional team and played professional matches or been to World Cups or whatever, a lot of things, and you haven't got that experience, it doesn't mean much. Stuff to bring it over and to, to kind of put it into, into the country and into the rugby players. So I think development-wise is, is where it needs to start. And, you know, the World Rugby does give us the opportunity and, and they've... They fed up, mate. They've been giving us um, funds for years now, and nothing. Rugby's going backwards. I look at teams like Georgia. Okay, Georgia has a different different level. You know, they, they obviously have a bit of cash. Well, I, I think with what they're doing. Yeah, I think Mo had uh, Alfred funds then. The Montpellier. Yeah, them. but we've got people who are willing to give money. You know, we've got um, teams who want to, but they don't want to give it to the NRU. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's been frustrating. You know, I, I want to get involved in wherever I can get involved, but I'm not willing to work with people who, who, um, who are selfish, who want to do it for themselves or um, who want to go on the next trip, like I said, and want to get the glory of, of getting kit or getting whatever the case may be or just saying that I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a coach or I'm a president or whatever. I want guys who believe and let the Namibian rugby can win a game with the World Cup or that can go through to the next round or make top 15 in, in the world, which is possible. Um, there's, there's good rugby players. There's good rugby players. They just need to be invested in, and they need, they need someone with a vision who can go out there and, and, and grow the game and, and believe in it. So, um, yeah, that's the frustrating bit, is, is where do I get involved? So the, probably the best part is to get involved with a local school. You know, that's, that's the school. We've got a school about 25 kilometers from, from where I live, out on the farm. So I think that'll probably be my first step, just to get involved with the school and, and see where I can I can make a difference there. And, and until things sort itself out, 
then um, then we can move on to something else. But I mean, the passion is there. I want to do it, and I want to grow the game. I miss it. I miss being involved in the huddles. I miss being out there and and, and watching guys smash each other. And uh, yeah, I miss it. So I want to get involved. So I'm hoping, Jim, we can get a, a um, there's the right time and the right people, and 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 yeah, we can take things forward, forward from there. Mate, good on you. There's no point rushing into it. Yeah. You know, you, you've got to buy yeah. the time. And Matt, I appreciate you being quite candid there because I think it's important. I think sometimes you can just follow suit and, and say what's right. But you know, you're the most successful Namibian to come out of yeah uh, the country. Yeah, I have to, mate. Oh, it's 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 my obligation. I have to do it. I mean, it's for too long. People have been quiet. I don't know if they what they're afraid of. Um, their name gets tainted or whatever. But I've, what I've done in rugby, I've done it. You know, it's it's done. But now I need to use that to, to make a difference over here. And um, but I, I can't do it if there's not enough selfless people around me who want us to see the movie and rugby flourish out in the world. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's the tough part we have to cross. And, and I, won't, I won't be quiet. I won't be quiet. We'll, we'll, we'll get the right people eventually. Um, I'm just afraid it's going to take um, it's going to take its toll on on, on rugby in Namibia. So we'll see we'll see how it works out. Hopefully things happen, positive things happen, and we'll move in the right direction. Yeah, fingers crossed. Uh, last two things. <laughs> yeah. Where's the the lead gone? You you cut the locks off. Why? <sighs> Jimbo. Is that, is that the old year? <laughs> <laughs> it's. Uh, you know, when I, the first couple of months, I think probably four or five months, I decided, listen, okay, this is me. I'm going to keep my hair. And I started farming. So I had I had the man bun up, and it was through the cap at the back. And uh, it was 40 degrees, flies all over your face. But it wasn't fun. It wasn't fun at all. And uh, it was hot, and I was sweating. And I thought, listen, it's time to make the call. Cut it off. Um, it was a shame. I still think sometimes, I, I said to my missus, I listen, Maybe I should just grow for one more time, just to see because the hair is getting less as well. That's that's the other thing. Um, I thought uh, I thought it would stay forever. It looked like I had a lot of hair at some Good. stage, but it's getting, it's getting less and less. So yeah, it's the heat, mate. It's functional. It's, it's functional. Uh, yeah, lastly, it then it's easier. Give give me a bit of perspective where you are. I've seen the pictures on Instagram, but just show me a perspective from where you are now of uh, Namibia, from where you're sat now on your veranda. I'm currently at my at my um, my folks' place here with my dad. Um, lockdown's just been um, eased. Um, I think it was on Tuesday, so I wasn't allowed to see them for a long time. So we invented now in the capital, which is right oh, in the middle okay. of it. Yeah. yeah. So, but my farm's situated a bit south, about uh, 320, 340 kilometers from here. So in the Kalahari, mm. uh, out in the middle of nowhere. Um, so, like I said, we've been self-isolating for a, for a long time. But it's um, it's made it's beautiful. I've I've told you you should go and visit, and you've made promises, but I mean oh. you're too busy, obviously. Oh, I know. Uh, too busy. Transition. But, I mean, you should you should come down, and we should do a show again or, or another talk, and you can come and see what what life is like for me now. And it's it's you, I think you'll enjoy it. It's it's so much different, so much different that you can't really, you can't really think that that it's the same person that played professional rugby in in the UK, like you said, London. It's you fly all over the world. It's New York. It's all these things, and now you're back on the farm and it's so chilled. And but it's beautiful, mate. It's 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 a it's a, I made my it's a family decision I made at the end of the day. It's um, it's definitely not a financial one. Um, I just thought it would give me a little bit more money than it actually does. Uh, <laughs> that I would survive a little bit better. But uh, thanks to the drought, they didn't. That didn't re- happen. So, um, but I mean, the the amount of time I spend with my kids and my family is is, is very important for me. Um, and I wanted my kids to have that life space. You know, um, not every, everything is well, in the UK, especially kids go to school so early. You know, and I always feel felt sorry for them going from training or. Um, leaving in the morning, I see them. It's wet outside. It's cold. Kids walking to school. They they just do it. It's it's what they have to do. But I just wanted my kids to be kids for a while. Just go come back to their home country and and, and play. You know, be in the sun and and have space. Have animals around them. It's it's they always remember that when they grow up and they can always move on from there. But I wanted to I wanted to come back to Namibia and and, and raise my kids here. That's just just for the for the for the. Um, the chilled lifestyle, you know, the um, wide open spaces, sunny days every day, the small things that, that you miss when you're in the UK and that you can now experience again. 
Well, if anyone deserves it or has earned the right to do that, it's you, Shark. And I really appreciate you, you chatting friend. to me, mate. Appreciate um, that, Jimbo. Yeah, I miss you, Thank mate. You. I'm gonna, please I'm gonna, I'm gonna come out. I miss there. you too. I keep saying that. You should, please, mate. I, pro please, I, I please, promise you. you welcome, I give my mate. word here to the millions of people okay. that watch the show okay. that um, I'm gonna be Good. down there Good. once this is lifted um, via Good. New York, I'll maybe Vegas, and then round to you. Sam, that'd be awesome, mate. That'd be awesome. But I want to go to the other places as well with you. I've maybe I'll do it the other way around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome, Jack. Mate, thank you, yeah, buddy. Good to chat with you, man. Good luck. Legend. Thanks, buddy.